Hello, Ebenezer Church family. I'm sorry that we're not able to be together uh, during this Holy Week. Um, I'm looking forward to Easter Sunday, and certainly we'll have our service online. But I also want to provide something for you uh, for Good Friday that you could use in your own personal uh, devotional time, uh, maybe even for your family to gather around and have a, a time of worship together. And so um, I want to provide a, a brief devotion time uh, based on uh, the Gospel of Mark chapter 15, and really uh, the focus will be on the, the crucifixion of Christ and what he has accomplished for our sake in his death, and then obviously with Easter, the resurrection. So let me read um, first from uh, Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe, and those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard, hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw it saw in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. And there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. And when he was in, Gal when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Some years ago, some of you may remember a program that was on television. It would have been in the 1950s, I think, and it was called You Were There. And it was hosted by Walter Cronkite, and each episode would take viewers uh, back to some significant event in history and, and put it in such a way that you could be a bystander watching the things that would take place. Well, in a similar way, imagine that you are in the area outside the city of Jerusalem, except that there is no Jerusalem yet. Instead, all there is is wilderness, a mountainous region called Moriah. And in this area, you see walking through the terrain an old man and a young boy. Together they are ascending the rocky terrain, and you notice that the boy is carrying several pieces of wood on his back. From their conversation, you're able to discern that the old man is the father of the boy. The boy is his son. And as you listen, the boy asks his father the question, Father, we have the fire and we have the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? The old man responds, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And they continue on. Well, finally, they reach their destination and you notice that the old man assembles a crude sort of altar. He takes the wood that the boy was carrying and places it around the altar. And then all of a sudden the unimaginable happens. You notice that the old man binds up the hands and the feet of the boy and places him on top of the altar. 
And then with his knife in hand, he raises it up to plunge it into his son. But suddenly there is a voice, an otherworldly type voice that stays the old man's hand and says to him, do not lay your hands upon the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And right then you follow the old man's eyes to a nearby thicket, and there he sees a ram that has been caught by its horns, and he's able to go, and he kills the ram, and he's able to sacrifice it as a substitute in place of his own son. And the old man declares that the place will be called Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord or Jehovah will provide. Now imagine that you are at the same location, but it's many, many centuries later. Now there is a city that occupies the place. It is the city of Jerusalem. And in the exact spot where that altar was, there's another altar that stands in the shadow of a magnificent temple dedicated to the Lord. The city is crowded, bustling with all sorts of activity. And from the conversations, you're able to discern that it's Passover. It is the ancient Jewish celebration commemorating uh, the time when they were in bondage as slaves in Egypt and how God set them free. You'll remember that on the evening before the Exodus, God instructed the Jewish people to take a lamb and to sacrifice it and take the blood from that lamb and smear it on uh, the door frames of their home. And that lamb would be a substitute, and it would be offered up in death for the firstborn son in the home so that the angel would pass over, the angel of death would pass over that home, and the life of the firstborn would be spared. But now you notice a gathering of people that's moving outside the city walls, and there you see a man that has been beaten quite severely. The little clothing that he still has is colored in crimson. There's streaks of blood that are running down his face from a crown of thorns that has been thrust upon his brow. His eyes are nearly swollen shut from the fists of soldiers and the sadistic, violent-type games that men play. And like the young boy that you saw earlier, this man, too, is carrying a large piece of wood. But in his weakened condition, he staggers under the weight of it. There's no one to lend him a hand until a man from the crowd is drafted to come and take the piece of wood and carry it for him. At last, they reach their destination. It's a slightly elevated area beyond the city wall. It's called the Place of the Skull, because that's kind of how it looks when you see it from a distance, also called Golgotha. The man is forced to lie down on a vertical beam while the beam that he is carrying is set horizontally on top. And then a soldier, one holds him down, perhaps more than one, but another one takes a spike in his hand and he sets it on the man's wrist and he raises up the mallet to strike it. But unlike the father whose hand was stayed by a voice from heaven, there is no voice from heaven this time. And in the silence, the map comes crashing down upon the spike, shattering bone and flesh and muscle, tendon, nerves. The man writhes in pain as the grim act is repeated again on his other wrist and then again on his feet. A sign is posted above his head that says, King of the Jews. And then that wooden T that he is lying on, it's lifted up into place and he becomes a spectacle for all of those passing by to ridicule and to mock to mock and to, uh, to laugh at. Well, as in the first story here too, a father has not withheld his son, his only son, but he has offered him up. But unlike the young boy, this son has no substitute to take his place because he is the substitute. He is the ram that is caught in the thicket that Jehovah has provided for your sake and for mine. And as our substitute, he has taken the punishment that is ours upon himself. Listen to how the prophet 
uh, Isaiah describes it in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah writes, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. He has put him to grief. On that cross, that place called Golgotha, it was Jesus, our substitute, who bore the record of our sins. Every thought, every word, every deed that you and I will ever commit, all of those God has recorded. And as Second Corinthians 5.10 teaches us that record of our sins will testify against us one day on the day of judgment, were it not for the Lord who has taken that record upon himself. On the cross, Jesus, our substitute, bore God's justice. Contrary to modern minds, God is not ambivalent toward our sins. He is not easy in dismissing them, but rather his righteousness demands that our sin be punished, if not by us, then by someone else. On the cross, Jesus bore God's wrath. All of your sins and mine, they provoke God's righteous anger. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. But Christ has taken that cup of God's wrath, which is yours and mine to drink, and he has drank that cup. He has drank it all the way down to its very last drops. On the cross, Jesus, our substitute, bore our God-forsakenness. His cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That would be our cry of abandonment. Because he embodied our sins as Jesus hung on that cross, the light of the Father's countenance for the very first time ever, was turned away from him. All he saw was darkness. His father's face was now hidden. On the cross, Jesus, our substitute, bore our curse of death. It was the punishment that God had ordained all the way back in the garden, but Jesus died in our place, and as his lifeless body was placed in that tomb, he became the Lord of life for sinners slain. Friends, that is what Christ, God's provision, and our substitute has done for you and for me. But it's not just that Christ took these things upon himself, all that was ours. No less than that, God also has taken what belonged to Christ and he has given those things to us. In the place of our record of sin, God has given us the record of Christ's righteousness, his sinless perfection, his obedience. That record is credited to you and me through faith in him. And now God looks upon us and we are acceptable in his sight. In the place of God's justice, he gives us our Lord's pardon. We are forgiven. We go free because he was condemned in our place. In the place of God's wrath, God has given us his grace. A man named Milton Vincent makes a wonderful observation here. The gospel reminds us that uh, actually we deserve that cup of wrath. We would drink that churning cup of torment every day if it were up to us. And this is the cup that would be ours, but Christ has drank that cup for us. 
And if he drank that cup for us down to the very bottom, leaving nothing there for us, that would be extraordinary, worthy of our forever praise. And if he were to leave one drop, or leave rather a, a drop of his blessings in that cup, not just empty it, but leave a drop of blessings there, that would be beyond compare. But he hasn't given us an empty cup, and he hasn't given us a cup with a drop, but rather he gives us a cup that is overflowing with all the blessings of heaven for us to enjoy. We are able to drink from the cup of salvation because Christ in our place drank for us the cup of his wrath. And he gives us that cup without the slightest mixture of wrath. And because of that, we should be dumbfounded dumbfounded with inexpressible joy. In place of being forsaken by God, God gives us his acceptance as beloved sons and daughters. When the Father sees us, he sees us as his own son with joy and acceptance and pleasure. And in place of the curse of death, God has given us the blessing of everlasting life. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall be made alive. Rather than the hell of eternal separation from God under his wrath, we have the blessings of heaven. We have the promise of eternal life and ever-exceeding joy that will go on forever and ever. Friends, do you realize the blessings that are yours and mine through Jesus Christ that come to us at his expense? I hope especially on this Good Friday, but truly every day, you and I will take the time to go and gather at the foot of the cross and meditate and contemplate on all that our Lord has done, his work of redemption on our behalf when we put our faith in him. This is part of what it means to recalibrate our lives back to the gospel every day. Each day and throughout the day, we continually look to Christ crucified as our substitute, God's provision, and we apply the truths of that cross and the truths of the gospel to our lives in personal ways. Jerry Bridges writes this, Herein lies the glory of the cross. Justice and mercy are reconciled. Wrath and love are both given full expression and all so that we might experience the unsearchable riches of Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious and merciful Father, we give you thanks for this day. It is a day of great sorrow as we consider our Lord's sacrifice for our sake, but it is a day of great joy. It is a good Friday because on this day we remember that he bore all of those sufferings and all the punishment that was ours. He bore it in our place. He is our substitute. He is your provision, and for that we give thanks. Lord, take us ever deeper into the cross of Christ our Lord. And as we contemplate on it, make it all the richer for us on the Easter that is coming as we celebrate his glorious resurrection and the new life that we have in him. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. I hope this has been a time of blessing for you. And uh, I do want to encourage you, uh, this is Good Friday, use this time um, as uh, you probably have gotten emails, a time of fasting and prayer as we join in conjunction with uh, other denominations, the PCA, and the EPC, and the, uh, the Anglican Church of North America. Let's have a, a time today of fasting and prayer as we humble ourselves before the Lord and seek his face, and let us meditate upon all that the Lord has done for us. Blessings to you.